So am I, yeah, I am on. Okay, well, welcome to uh, Hendersonville Church of Christ Wednesday night for June 13th. Um, Les is out of town. I think he went to Dollywood and Gatlinburg and some other stuff with his family. So uh, I thought, boy, you know what? I don't think everybody wants to hear me just talk for 45 minutes. And I had come up with an idea for some uh, interactive stuff that we could do with our phones, you know, like we do sometimes after the Chosen episodes. And I kind of went down that path a little bit. And then, un and then unfortunately, Cheryl had a uh, Compassionate Hands board member meeting late this afternoon that she just got out of about 15 minutes ago uh, for their budgetary process for the homeless in Wilson County. And I said, well, you're not going to be there to run the computer for that part that we do with that software that other people, you know, haven't been trained on, which is fine. And I thought, so that's not going to work. So I was back to just me again, and I thought, no, that's not a good idea. So I went to lunch yesterday with Nathan White, and while we were at lunch, I, I twisted his arm, and he decided that he would join me. So uh, I'm looking forward to that, um, give, you, give you a different, cup, a different voice to listen to and different brain and different, different heart and different uh, thought process. So we're excited about that. So we'll uh, open with prayer, and then Nathan will come up here, and we'll go through uh, Chosen for Discipleship and have a couple of connections to Episode 3 of Season 2 of The Chosen, but not many. I mean, like I've told you, we're not really trying to come in here and just do a rehash of the previous Sunday night because you've watched it and you've probably had your own discussions at home or whatnot. Um, and if you haven't watched it, these lessons don't necessitate that you've seen it in order to follow along with us or understand. But there were some powerful statements from that that we've kind of, uh, kind of threaded into the discussion tonight. So I'll let, uh, I'll let the Fosters find their seat so that we don't start a prayer and with people in the aisle way. And then we'll uh, pray and get started. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, just a beautiful day. It was nice to have a little break from the heat, and yet the sunshine was out. It still feels like summer, but it's not quite as oppressive as it, as it has been, and we thank you for that. Um, I thank you for my brother Pete being here tonight, and I just lift him and his situation that you were fully aware of. Uh, please, please be with him as he enters a challenging phase in his life to be healed, and we pray that that all goes well and that the results are, um, are just miraculous, that we can point to nothing other than you for the outcome of that, and that it's uh, as easy as it can be on, on Pete and, uh, and the family. I pray now that as we go into this conversation about being chosen for discipleship and those that are online that are uh, navigating it with us, that whatever's going on in everybody's life, um, whatever needs they have and whatever things they're wrestling with that you already know about, that if we pause for just a second, may all the names come up to you about the situations, whether that be health concerns or job loss or uh, marital problems or um, just depression, just uh, who, all manner of things that people, that people carry with them that they don't oftentimes share the details of, but we know that you know. So as we pause for just a second, um, everyone feel free to lift up those names that are on your heart and your mind. Father, we know you hear us, and we know that you know everything we're going to say before we say it. Um, we're still amazed at those facts that Scripture tells us, and even though we don't totally understand them, we believe them. We thank you for just how much you love us, and definitely how much you love us that you sent your Son, and that you uh, have chosen us to be conformed to his image. And be with us now as we discuss that and bless this time together. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on up, brother. You can, well, here, I'll scoot over. You can have this side. So we're doing this series, Chosen for Discipleship, and um, I think sometimes what ends up happening is that we get mixed up with what discipleship is. We oftentimes think discipleship is that if the church has a smorgasbord of things that it offers and we go to all of them, that we're, we're good disciples. Um, and that may be true, but that can't be the totality of what discipleship is, because if, the, if we're just doing things, 
we're not necessarily transforming. So Nathan and I thought we'd start tonight with a question that I've actually asked on Sunday morning. Uh, we're into the, we just finished the second week of a new quarter, and in the class I'm teaching, we're looking at what the gospel is and how we've kind of shrunk it. And so I asked the same question to you that I asked to my class, which is, what is the good news? And there's a bunch of different answers that usually come up, but the short of it is the good news is much bigger than we probably realize, and it's a whole lot bigger than we can distill down to a bumper sticker or something to talk to somebody in you know, 10 seconds and try to convince them to come to all of those church functions. Um, it's bigger than that. And I would say that one of the biggest blocks to people being able to understand the good news, Nathan, is that they've got this idea that they've got to add something to it. They've got to do enough. They've got to have been good enough. They've got to have visited enough people. They've got to not use too many bad words, whatever it is that they're, that's their litmus test. And really, Jesus has taken care of our death problem in his death and resurrection. So if we think about Genesis 3 and the curse, that you eat of this tree, and when you do, you will surely die. Now we don't go to that destiny thanks to him. So doesn't that free us up to, to think about, okay, that's good news. That means we're going to live eternally. So let's get about living. Well, we're, we're trying to worry about something we can't control. We can't. We won't ever be good enough. We won't ever be able to do enough, visit enough people. Right. Um, it's not about us. It's about what he did for us. Yeah, and just that alone allows the good news to kind of take a little bit different shape. It's, like, it's not so much, well, it's good news that I'm chosen, but I hope I don't get kicked out. It's good news that I'm chosen, but I hope I don't do enough that I'm not chosen any longer. It's good news that I have eternal life as long as I actually get there and find out that I do and I hear a good and faithful servant. There's a lot of hand-wringing and a lot of worrying about something that's put to rest, right? Yeah, he doesn't want us to live in fear. He right. wants us to live in love right? and to show that. Exactly. So tonight we're, we're trying to think about that. We're looking, at, we're looking at a very fascinating verse. Mark is the only gospel that has this, this phrasing. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, and some of the translations, I use the New English translation because the NIV actually uh, puts good news in there, the, the, you know, as we've learned, the definition of gospel rather than the word gospel. So I, I use the New English translation because it still uses the word gospel. But now after John was in prison, John the Baptist... Jesus went into Galilee and proclaimed the gospel of God. And I'll never forget sitting in seminary class when one of the professors brought this up, and it's one of those things, you know, you're, you're comparing the, the gospels and you're looking at the differences in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And then he said, what does that mean? And we were all just kind of stumped. We were like, well, I'm not really sure because he can't possibly be preaching about his death, burial, and resurrection at this point. Nobody would understand that. He hasn't told anybody that. And this is right at the beginning of his ministry in the first chapter of Mark. So the, so the good news of God or the gospel of God must be that the Old Testament is actually, the promises of the Old Testament are actually being fulfilled. Because Jesus reconciles fallen humanity to God through himself and restores us to our original image and glory, which is a vocational assignment that we had, that we lost. But the good news is he's here and all those promises of God in the Old Testament to be with his people in a way like never before is happening because he's, he's arrived, which is what he stood up and read from the scroll that we talked about last week from Isaiah 61. Fulfilling the scriptures. Exactly. What, what, he's, what, they, what the predictions were is now being fulfilled. Right. And it's powerful to think about, you know, one of the things I said in class, which I'm not trying to be funny, I'm trying to give us an image of scriptural image that makes this really make sense. <clears throat> if you go back in the Old Testament and you look at what the sacrifices were made for, and you think about the Leviticus situation specifically, like the, the scapegoat and the goat that slaughtered and you know the Day of Atonement and all that. Well, if you go back and you study that, and somebody were to come running and go, hey, Nathan, hey, Nathan, hey, Nathan great, good, good news, good news. The lamb or the goat that we had, mm -hmm. it died. Yeah. And you say, okay. But the natural question would be, and what was the death of that animal? What did the death of that animal accomplish for me exactly? Because right. it can't be just good news that something died that, by the way, didn't have any reason that it had to. Right. Well, that's the definition of 
Jesus. That's the definition of the Messiah. He didn't need to die. He wasn't worthy of death, but he did. And what did that do for us? And that's what actually the good news is. That was the cost of what right. our good news is. So the gospel then is good news that enables life. Jesus says he comes to bring life and to bring it to, to its fullest and we actually have this opportunity to stop worrying about all that that, that would end be life ending and actually get, get on to actually enabling us to live. And it affects change in the lives of those who say they believe it. What do you think about that? That's what we're called to do, is to believe what you talked about, that the scripture was fulfilled. He has saved us. It, it goes back to what I was saying about worrying about things that we have no control over. Mm -hmm. We just now have to believe. And that's a change in us that then if we can take that and change ourselves, our next step is to change others to affect their belief, yeah. to help them understand it as well. Yeah, so have you ever met anybody that's a professing Christian that doesn't seem to have much effect of change going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, there's a lot of folks I'm afraid that walk around with kind of this idea of a life insurance policy that when it's needed, mm -hmm. then I'll have good news. When that day when I get there, mm -hmm. I'll find out that I get to continue. Right. But until then, this really isn't applicable to me because I'm in the world doing the things of the world and, and well, I just don't right. really know what to do with that right now. Right. And so yeah. there's not a lot of there's not a lot of internal work. There's not a lot of uh, transformation that looks like it goes on. It just kind of looks like, yeah, I, I was baptized, and I've even had people say this, just in case mm -hmm. that this all turns out to be true. Right. And it's like, wow. You know, or, or they'll say it like this. Well I, well, I sure would hate to get to the end of life and find out that you know, I had done whatever I wanted to do and there is a God. So I, I went ahead and believed because if I get to the end of life and there's not a God, well, then what's the difference? I've just lived as a good person, and, uh, you know, there wasn't a God anyway. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's not the same as what okay. the good news is to actually to live life to its right. fullest. I, I've had conversations with people that said, I, I believe, but I question my belief. Yeah, but that's because, spiritual, actually. I know. But, <laughs> but they're to the point where they're like, so what's the use? Yeah. Well, that's unfortunate, because... The scripture, of course, is, Lord, I believe, but help, help my unbelief. Me. Yes. You know, that, that's okay. Right. If we recognize we have some, some needs, he mm -hmm. will help us. Right. Um, but I'm just kind of talking about the people who, who just kind of look at it as a just-in-case, mm -hmm. and then they don't really daily do anything yeah. with it. So we're chosen, then, to reach people. I don't know if you've thought about this or not, but you know, as we use this wording, and this is going to go on through the rest of the slides here tonight, is, well, we're chosen. What does that mean? How are we chosen? When were we chosen? What are we chosen for? Those are all things we're going to be looking at here in a minute. But one of the things that we're chosen for is to reach people. And we cannot reach people in the world by living lives, lives that are indistinguishable from them. If we try to say, well, you know, Nathan, I don't know. If I go up here and I say something, I'll get labeled a bobble banger, or thumper, mm -hmm. or whatever the term is, or I'll be a goody two-shoes, or I'll be the one that says, hey, 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 we don't really want to do this. This isn't a good idea because, well, why? Well, it hurts somebody's feelings, or it'll make somebody who may already be depressed go and do something that we would hope they wouldn't do, or, or whatever. And so we're the, we're the ones that people kind of point fingers at, and so you don't like that, and when you don't like that, you try to blend in. But when you blend mm -hmm. in, well, you've been chosen not to blend in. So... Mm -hmm. There's a dichotomy right there. You can't affect change if you're just going to blend in. You have to stand out to show people the way you live your life. There's something about this. There's something to this. There's something that distinguishes me. Yeah. And then maybe you get the opportunity to share what that is at that point. And isn't it okay with all the promises that Jesus has made with us, I'll be with you until the very end, and I'm with you always, isn't it okay if you get ridiculed, or if it seems to not go very well? Because, you, if you, like you said, if you're not different, then there's no catalyst for anybody even thinking about anything. So you may, you may get made fun of right in the moment. Mm -hmm. You might get a lot of pushback. You might lose some friends temporarily, whatever the situation is. But those people aren't going to go away and not 
continue to think about what you said or did compared to if you didn't do it. And if you never get that, if you never get ridiculed, if you never get attacked, if you never get called the goody two shoes, you get called the Bible thumper or whatever, maybe if I'm doing that, if I never get that, maybe I'm not doing something right because I am blending in at that point. I'm not putting myself out there. Well, yes, and I wonder if we could rephrase it from we're not doing something right to we're just simply, we've got the bushel over our lamp. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's kind of one of those things where you could, you could not be sinning, you could actually not be doing anything wrong, but you just aren't the light at that point. You're not the salt. You're just, you're just lost. You've lost your saltiness. You've lost your, you've lost your wick. Right. So you're just in the crowd and right. no one knows it. But yeah, I think that's, uh, that's an important distinction. So we're also chosen to be different. That's what we're talking about. We're chosen not to blend in. And wholehearted followers of Jesus live differently from the world. Um, because if they don't, then they don't, they're not really wholehearted followers. That's the whole part of the discipleship part. Is you know, when, when we said last week, when Les and I were up here and we said, well, how did that go down exactly when Jesus said, follow me, and they just dropped their nets and they just followed him? And we, we kind of walked through that with you and said, how strange that seems to be to us, but it wouldn't be strange to them. Because no one had offered them, no one had extended that invitation to them. They had been passed over by all the other rabbis. And so if, it, it's kind of a situation where uh, if you're a follower of a rabbi, you're going to do everything that rabbi does. You're going to try, in a way, to become just like that person. Now, you have your, little, you have your own idiosyncrasies and your own personality. I, and I don't, get, don't get me wrong on that. You don't have to try to talk like them, sound like them. You don't have to necessarily dress just like them. You don't have to carbon copy the person as far as their human attributes. But you try to be interested in what they're interested in. You go where they go. You study what they study. You, you learn what they know and you model how you interact with people the way they interact with people. And if we're wholeheartedly followers of Jesus, we're going to be doing that. Um, and what's interesting is, as you can see on the screen, is many people in the world will simply respect us because of that character and its compelling nature for people to go, whoa, wait a second. You know, I think I'm a pretty good person. I've heard this. I've heard people say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I've never killed anybody. I, I break for small animals running across the road in front of me. I don't steal. Uh, I'm nice to elderly people. I hold the door open for folks. Uh, I use, you know, I use clean language. Uh, I don't embezzle. I, um, I, I don't know what I would get from you people that I'm not already doing. But then when they see us wholeheartedly following Jesus, mm -hmm. there's another level of distinction right. that's not there just by being a moral person, right? Right, because it's, I mean, it, wholehearted is the word you keep going to. That's, it's not... Partial, it's it's the whole deal, and it they know what they believe. They know it. You, it's it's something you know, and you know how to love. And it's compelling, because we are trying to live the example that Jesus set. Yeah, we are trying to know that what he said and, to do, and, and really, know that how to love. We're all of that. We're trying to do all that outside of here. Right. Because if we're doing it in here, well, I would be shocked if any of you ridiculed me or Nathan for trying to do something like Jesus in here. But if we go out of here and say, well, that was our, that was our second of the week uh, attendance to the church building, and you know, we'll be back on Sunday, and we'll contemplate more stuff then then we miss all the opportunities that God puts in front of us on Thursday and Friday and Saturday. We have to be intentional about going out to where the people are. Yeah, because I think because the whole that, hearted is the whole life is what I'm getting at. Yeah, I mean, it's every day. It's Tuesday. It's Thursday afternoon. It's situations we talked about yesterday with the, with the uh, waitress. Right. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it, you, you're living it every day when you, you think about the things that when you deal with something is... Simple as a waiter or waitress got your order wrong. Mm. Or, in my case specifically, I've been an official. I know there's, some, there's a few officials 
retired in here. I've been an official for a long time. And it's how you react from my standpoint when I'm on the field or on the gym floor. But it's also when I see people react to me in a call that I made. And, you know, in 37 years, I've probably got two or three wrong. So... <laughs> <laughs> Glad you guys laughed. That, yeah. was a, that was clearly a joke. But it, you have to be careful because there's always people watching. You never know who's going to be there. You never know what, who's going to see you react and how you react. And I, t I was telling Stan that years ago, I, and let me preface this by saying I have never called a Hendersonville Church of Christ <laughs> softball game. But I have called church league softball. And a long time ago, I called my assigner and said, don't ever give me another church league softball game. Because it is some of the most ill-tempered, angry people I have ever seen that go to church, I thought. Mm. And I had, I'll just share one particular situation. I made a call, and I, as, as a, if you're officially here, you know, I made a call, and I was 100% sure that I got it right. But the guy playing second base came up and come unglued on me with X church on his jersey. I'd never heard some of the words he said. And I looked at him, I let him go, and I didn't say anything, and I just looked at him, and I said, do you pray with that mouth? And he stopped. And he walked off the field. So, it's how you act in all situations, not just when you come in here. It, you know what? It's easy to come in here, but it's when you're out and, you know, the nice young lady steps in front of you at the grocery store because she's got somewhere to be. It's how you treat people. It's how you treat situations. It, it really, I call it worship. It's, it's your worship when you're out there and you see how people treat other people. Good and bad. There's a lot of good in the world. I'm not saying it's all bad. There's a lot of good in the world, but there's a lot of bad. And we need to be wholeheartedly showing that we believe that we are in a good place. And we need, we need to help other people see that and help them grow as well. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I, while you were talking, I was thinking about how, and yet... We can all be susceptible to that at times too. Mm -hmm. And what, what a blessing it was for you to help that person recognize, mm -hmm. hey, 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 I think, you're, I think you're not acting the way you mean to. Mm -hmm. And you're caught up in the moment. You're caught up in the emotion. And of course, while you're saying that, I'm thinking of Peter denying Jesus. <laughs> Same thing, you know, like, uh, and adamantly de denying him right. and getting so mad and saying that, you know, I don't, I don't even know the man. Um, and then, of course, later re really realizing that it, that wasn't true and he wished he hadn't even said it. And so I, I think even the way you described that is not, not so much to fixate or focus on the individual who, you know, you gave, that, you gave that zinger to and said, do you pray with that mouth? But you found a gracious way to kind of do a course correction and say, hey, whoa, 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 yeah. wait a minute. Because you could have said, what's that on your shirt? Or who are you right. representing right, right now? Or, you know, something yeah. like that, which could have led to... Pretty, pretty probably uh, unfriendly argument, right. but instead it was mm -hmm. just something of a reminder. Yeah. And, that, and we need to be there to remind each other stuff like that without it being uh, unkind. Mm -hmm. So thanks for yeah. the way you handled that. Well, that kind of walks us into some of the stuff that went on in season two, episode three. It was the shortest, it was the shortest episode of the season, if you or a regular chosen watcher. Uh, it was only like 37 minutes, but it was, it was focused on Matthew 4, 24, which is on the screen. News about him spread, of course, Jesus, all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and paralyzed, and he healed them. So in the episode, right from the beginning, the disciples are all running around and Jesus is off, and, and they're counting how many people, and Matthew's doing math computations of, you know, how, well, if he sees 500 people and more people are joining the line, you know, we're going to be here all day. And, 
there's some comments back and forth about, yeah, we know that. Um, but basically what's happening is Jesus is off working, and they're hobnobbing around and talking about other things. And so it actually moves from the day to the night, and they've got this nice fire going, and Mary, Mary talks about getting up and going and getting the evening meal ready. And so you get this idea of these subplots that start to develop around the fire. And this is important. I don't, I don't of course, know where all they're going to go with uh, season three through seven, but we know from the Bible that these subplots are real. We know that there were arguments and, and things that were emotion, just, like, just exactly like mm -hmm. what you were just talking about, Nathan. Yeah. Because we even see it at the, at the Thursday night Last Supper, we see right after Jesus tells them, this is the bread broken for you, it's my body, this is the cup. What do they do? They turn around and they start arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And they're, all, and they're at the table with him, and yeah. he's instituting the new covenant, and they're over there saying, well, am I going to be better than you, or are you going to be better than me? Mm -hmm. So to get to that kind of craziness, somewhere it had to start. And what the Chosen's doing is showing you how it gets started. And around this fire, there's all these comments about like, hey, when are we going to get to the fun stuff? When are we going to get to the sword play? When are we going to get to the, you know, dethroning the Romans? When are we going to get away from this healing people? Sure, if he wants to heal people, that's great. I'm glad he's healing people. But this seems to be slowing us down for what we need to be doing with the Messiah. Well, there's, there's an example of not understanding what the Messiah came to do. And then they turn on Matthew. Uh, Peter just does an all-out verbal assault on Matthew. And then everybody else kind of joins in. Well, I shouldn't say everybody. Several, several of them join in, including Philip uh, and little James and a few others. And they all start piling on to Matthew. How dare you be someone who's rich, who has nice clothes, who worked for the Romans that we're trying to get with the Messiah to overthrow. And Peter ends up saying some stuff that he can't really take back. He says to Matthew, and of course I'm paraphrasing all this, he says something to the effect of, I'll never forgive you for you working for the Romans. I'll never forgive you for the taxes you put on my family that caused me to have a really hard time and have to figure out how to raise this money that I owed and all these things. And, it, and, they, and they finally have to tell Peter, you've made your point. You know, Big James does. He's like, okay, you've said what you needed to say. You can back off of him now. But he just keeps on and keeps on and, and keeps on attacking. And it's that mob mentality. Once one or two starts more come in and it takes somebody with a voice of reason to step up and say hey that's yeah. enough and so james tries it right yeah. big james tries it john's kind of being kind of quiet and then mary says mm -hmm. in the middle of all this uh somebody says something about you know why is he here what does he come for and she says i don't think he's waiting for us to be holy i think he's here because we can't be holy without him and i think it's uh bartholomew who kind of goes that's uh that's powerful. You know, that's, that's a really big statement. Because they kind of realize that things are kind of going in a trajectory that's not real healthy. Um, and if they're doing anything, they're not being holy. They're not being distinct or they're being different or being the set apart from the world. They're actually acting just like everybody in the world does because they're attacking Matthew and they're making all these comments about we got to convince Jesus to do what we want him to do, and we've got to get him back to what we think he should be doing rather than healing people. So all this stuff is going on, and then he comes in. And I know Susie told me, she said, uh, if you don't mind me telling him, Susie says, yeah, I sat there watching that, and I thought, man, this whole episode is just about this fire you know, conversation, mm -hmm. and we get it, you know, we get it, we get it. And then Jesus walks by, and she goes, oh, yeah, okay, that, I see what happened there. You know, here he comes in exhausted, his feet are hurting, he's sweaty, he's visibly tired. They're sitting there doing all this discussion and pushback and whatever, and it just stops. And when it stops and he walks by, he just says to them, good night. Yeah, he walks by. I mean, it's, it, it's a situation where he knows what they've been talking about. He obviously knows. Sure. He knows what they've been talking about. He knows what they're arguing about. And that walk, that that is... To me, he is walking through going, I am not dealing with you kids tonight. I am worn out, and I'm going to bed. Because dealing with people and healing people there all day, is, it, it was exhausting. I'm sure it was. Yeah. And, and he's going to bed to rest because, again, what I got out of that as much as anything is there are numerous times throughout where we're talking about, you know, what all we got to do, and we got to do this, and we got to do that. But 
we got to remember that we've got to feed ourselves as well. We've got to take a little bit of time and back up and feed ourselves and relax and be ready to go again. Because he wasn't done. He was gonna, it was going to start happening again. But he needed some rest. And that's what he's doing. And I think this was, I mean, he was healing people, everything, showing you. I, I got a little bit, I felt like I was getting a little bit of a glimpse of what it's going to be like to be in the presence of God. Mm. Because at that point, there is no sickness, no illness, and he's about to establish the fact that there's no death. So there's a moment here where in the presence of him, he's healing everybody. Now that, that's really important, because if we're connecting dots of what we've talked about mm -hmm. already, so we started tonight talking about the good news of, the, of God, the good news or the gospel of God that Jesus is teaching and preaching. Well, he's not only teaching and preaching it, here he's, he's exemplifying it mm -hmm. by healing these people, right? So he's yeah. setting all this stuff right. People who can't walk can walk, lepers are healed, blind people are mm -hmm. seen. All the stuff that God is doing to say that everything that was promised in the Old Testament is actually even visually happening. Yeah. Now you've got this group of people all sitting around arguing about all this stuff and doing anything but acting like their rabbi that we just talked about. You would do whatever a rabbi would do, you would do. And he walks by, and you can kind of see, they didn't even need any words. You can kind of just say, oh boy, you know, there he is showing us how new creation will be and setting all of these people with, with different issues to, to the good. Mm -hmm. And he's exhausted himself doing it all. And we're sitting here and we haven't really done anything except just burn a bunch of hot air and get mad at each other. And he just walks by and there goes our rabbi and we're not really acting like him at all. Yeah. So all of that, I think, non-verbally happens in that mm -hmm. scene. So simply put, Jesus' disciples are chosen to live so dynamically, so boldly, and so brightly that their lives elevate and illuminate everything in the world around them. And that was the least thing that they were doing around the fire. Yeah. And so, you know, it's pretty easy to point at them and say, well, that's what the writers decided, that's what they wanted you to get from that episode, and maybe we're getting more from it or less, I don't know. But the point is, that's us, we do mm -hmm. the same thing. We, we get irritated. You know, you were talking about a while ago on your referee stuff, and unfortunately, I have heard from other people similar stories, specifically people who wait tables, that Sunday's the absolute worst day. Mm -hmm. They said, here come all the church people in. They got their nice clothes on, and they come in, and they send, half of them send their orders back. They leave no tips. They're rude to the, to the waitresses or the waiters. And I'm like, why, why is that? And it's so crushing to hear somebody say yeah I'd rather work any day but Sunday because I don't want to deal with the people who come in from the churches and I'm like wow and then that makes that scene look like we we live that scene out quite often and if you didn't want to go back and do a softball series for no. a church you felt kind of the same thing no. I mean I took myself out of an entire league yeah and that's a league that fills a slot where you know if you're doing that for for making money I took that away because I, it just wasn't worth dealing with. Yeah. It just wasn't. And that's, that's hard to speak into. And mm -hmm. so Jesus decides not to speak into it. He just walks yeah. by, and the, the walk by, and the good night, and the exhaustion speaks for itself. Yeah. And another thing that happens in that scene, and then we'll move on, we won't, we won't belabor the, the episode, is Mary, Jesus' mother, says something very interesting. She's talking with the other Mary there, and everybody else is listening, and she says, you know, when he came into the world, he was completely helpless. I don't think we think about that. If you think about the, the master narrative of the Bible, you oftentimes see spiritual beings who come in and out of the story, right? I mean, three men come to visit Abraham and Sarah, for example. Jacob wrestles with an angel. Uh, the angel of the Lord shows up to Joshua. There's all kinds of interaction between beings from the other realm in ours. But they never come completely dependent on us until Jesus comes. Jesus is an infant, and Mary says in the scene, she says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be polite. And she says he, he needed to be cleaned up after he was born, and he was completely helpless. Mm -hmm. And he depended on me for everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there going, this is God. And somebody had to clean him up and teach him to walk and teach him to talk and teach him to do math and all the things that, you know, I got taught. Mm -hmm. Because the incarnation is different than anything else before it. And then she says in that scene, and then I think you want to say something. She says in that scene, 
I don't think he needs me anymore now because he's just come back from healing all these people. Right. And she's like, what could I do? What could I possibly do for yeah. him? And that, you know, when she said that and when I heard that, it was the first time I had really ever put it in that context that he was born and he was completely helpless. You know, we see the pictures of the, you know, the little baby in the manger, uh, you know, and, and we kind of just push by it. But when that scene, when I saw that scene, I thought of when our son was born mm. and we took him home from the hospital two days later. And I remember having, I don't know what you want to call it, a panic attack, an anxiety attack, whatever it was. I'm looking, he's two days old and I'm like, I, I might break. I, him. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Uh, this is not going to work. I, I don't know what we're going to do with him because this is not going to work. I mean, he's two days old, and you know, we were in the hospital, and we had nurses taking care of him, and you know, they're in and out of the room, and oh, isn't he cute? And this is great. And then they put him in a car seat and said, "Go home." And I went, nah, I, don't, "I don't know. I don't. I don't think this is going to work. I, I don't know what to do." You know. So, but you figure it out. You, Mary figured it out. Yeah. And you always have your doubts. You know what she said? I don't think he needs me anymore. He did. Well, yeah, he, he most certainly did because he's just walked by. That's why we left that up there for so long mm -hmm. with the little animation. And his feet are hurting. And she goes to Jesus' tent um, and goes to tell him good night. And she helps him get his sandals off. Mm -hmm. And she helps wash his feet. And he gives her this big hug and says, you know, Mom, in, in Hebrew, what would I do without you? And so they even fixed, you know, they even help mm -hmm. with that. Like, yeah. you know, he's God, but he's, right. but when we're chosen, we're chosen forever. Mm -hmm. You know, like he, he, he doesn't have to remind us every day, you're chosen, you're still chosen today. Mm -hmm. The sun wakes up, you're chosen again, mm -hmm. Nathan. Yep. In the morning, you're chosen. Yep. And then Friday, you're chosen. Yep. If he doesn't say it, it doesn't mean that you're not needed. And so I right. think, I think that was even another interesting thing that they did yeah. there in that, in that episode. So let's look at what it means to be chosen. If we go, there's other texts, but these were just the ones that kind of came up this afternoon while I was putting this together. If you go to Isaiah 41.9, and again from the New English translation, um, it tells us right there. Now this is speaking about the, the servant, and, and I, want to, I want to bring these two things together. Okay, In 41.9 it says, You whom I am bringing back from the earth's extremities, that's all the people who were scattered into the other nations, and have summoned from the remote regions. I told you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. So if we've been chosen, and we've been selected, and it's permanent, then we don't have to keep asking if we're still chosen. Now, the servant, you are my servant, becomes very powerful, because that servant, as we know in Isaiah 53, is a foreshadowing to Jesus, and Jesus is the ultimate servant, and he's the one that ends up taking on the sin of the whole world, and becomes the servant of all, right? But then in Ephesians, we see, uh, for he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. And I think sometimes this trips people up. They think, well, okay, you kind of explained the holy part a while ago. It doesn't mean perfect. Then we see the word blameless, and we think, well, maybe it does mean perfect. But what it's saying is, in Christ, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. And we are to be set apart, we're to be distinct from the world around us. And the blameless part is not that we won't make mistakes, but that we are striving in Christ to be as much like him as we possibly can. And God knows all the things that, that keep us from actually arriving at the, at, the, at the perfectionism of that. So two interesting things, Old Testament text, New Testament text, and then if we put them together and we say, okay, well, then wait a second. What are, we're chosen for what exactly? Well, to be conformed to the image of Christ. We've all said that, right? We've even heard sermons on that. We maybe have said that ourselves. Um, the Holy Spirit is working in me, Galatians 4.19, as if, you know, a woman in labor that I might be formed into the image of Christ. And he's doing the same thing in all of you. And so we are being formed into the image of Christ. Okay, the image of Christ, we've looked at multiple different ways tonight, but one of the ways we just looked at from Isaiah is Christ is the suffering servant of the Old Testament. So Nathan, can that mm -hmm. possibly mean that we're going to win the lottery and everything's going to be great and we're going to be happy all the time? It, 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 it's not a... 
we're not here to be happy. He wants us to be happy. And we will be. And we will be happy. But it's, it, it, we're put here to glorify him, mm. to live a life that when he looks at us that he sees, you know, Nathan has got his struggles. He is really struggling, but I see he's trying. I see he's doing his best. And yeah, he's got his faults, but everybody else does too. And if we can get to that loving both God and people, mm -hmm. that's what he wants to see. He right. wants to look down there and see, I'm looking at somebody that loves me, and I'm looking at somebody that loves people. Because if we love him, we're going to love people, and we're going to try to get those people to love him as well. And we're going to create more people. That it's a, that whole that whole commercial years ago, you know, they tell two friends and they tell two friends, and, he, and, and it just goes on and on and on. And that's what he's looking for, is for us to go out there and do it. Well, I, I really like that example because I'm afraid that you know what I love to do is I love to lay things out that we've all heard that we kind of go, well, nobody's going to actually say that, and yeah. call me crazy. I, I sometimes say them, but you know I think what we've done is we've made it like a salesman's job. You know, we think that what it means to represent Jesus wherever we find ourselves and with whomever God places us, it has to close the deal. And if we don't close the deal, he goes, oh, man, you were so close, Stan, mm -hmm. and you didn't get that one done. But I like what you said. No, it's we're to love God and love other people, and he's with us, and he knows about the others that we don't know. Mm -hmm. And we might be just arm-twisting and dragging and doing whatever we can do, and he's just going, yeah, that's not going to work. That's not going to work yet. That's not going to work because they're not, they're not hearing you. They're not listening to you that. They haven't seen that yet. I haven't shown them that yet. You were just supposed to be somebody who shows you love me and love them and stop. You know, and just do that. And so I think, I think we, we put on ourselves a yoke that's heavier than what Jesus asks us to carry a lot of times. And, and you'll never know what, what effect you have on people. Sometimes you'll never know it. And briefly, and I'm cut this story short because my grandfather had a brother that was like an uncle to me because him and my dad were real close in age and my grandfather kept trying to get him to go to church get to go to church get to go to church never 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 would and my grandfather didn't beat him over the head with the bible he would just call sometimes and say hey you want to come to church with us mm -hmm. never did my grandfather passed away i think about eight years after he passed away my dad called me on a sunday afternoon and he goes you'll never guess who came to church today <laughs> It was my uncle. About six months later, my dad called me again, and he go, I baptized your Uncle Ray today. So I had to know. I went and had a conversation with him. I said, I got to know. I got to know. My grandfather tried for years and years, and you, you, you never did it. And he said, I finally come to the realization that I know where Guy White is because of the way he lived his life, and I don't want to be anywhere else wow. when I die. Wow. That was eight or ten years after my grandfather died. The effect that he had on somebody caused them to accept yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and, let, and let's be really crystal clear on the fact that we're not trying to say, well, this is a great wiggle way to not no. have to. No, here's the thing, though. If we're not careful and we make it about us and we try mm -hmm. to force it, like if your grandfather had tried to force mm -hmm. it, it will put him possibly into... Mm -hmm situations like on the ball field right. where you you stop and go well i was trying so hard to make something happen that i right. almost went into unchristian like activity right. to try to make it happen and right. then and then you're not doing what he no. what he asked you to do so mm -hmm. it's it's um it's a lighter load than than sometimes we do so questions that this might lead to i didn't skip one did i um no chosen no. for what all right so questions it might come up with this uh, who am i how am i gifted how can i use my chosen profession to serve others and how do I walk this out in the world? Well, those are good questions. That's what we come here for. That's why we come on Sundays, is to mm -hmm. think about these types of questions and help each other so that when we go back out into the world as doctors and nurses and accountants and as uh, you know, bus drivers and school teachers and um, whatever I'm forgetting that you are, I'm apologizing. I know that there's other things in here, computer programmers, uh, the airline pilots, that whatever you are, that's where he's placed you. And you go out saying, okay, this is how I'm gifted. This is what I do. How can I have my profession serve others as the suffering servant, loving them like God loves them? 
And that leads us to, if my clicker will work, okay, how? Well, the how is pretty, is pretty amazing to me because I think a lot of times we, we don't articulate it, but what we kind of lead people to think is the really dedicated Christians are the ones that really you know, just try harder than the others. But really, if you look at the text from Romans, that's not the case. It's, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. Not all things work together for good, but all things work together for good for people who actually love God. So there's the love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Mm -hmm. And things are going to work together. for You're going to be happy, like you said a while ago, but it right. might not be until everything's put right. right. And it's sure not going to be every day. But all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called, or I put in there, chosen according to his purpose. And his purpose is he knows you're an airline pilot, he knows you're a dentist assistant, he knows you're an accountant, he knows all these things, and he wants you to work through that, because that's the everyday. Mm -hmm. And then, skipping down a couple of verses in 31 of chapter 8, what then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So if he sends me into some scenario, he's not going to be like, <laughs> watch this, I'm going <laughs> to give him to the wolves and see, see if he can make it. No, he's, he's with me. Now, I may perceive it didn't go very well. Your granddad may have perceived none of those years went very well. Right. But God knew all along those years were going just fine. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. he's with them. Mm -hmm. First half of verse 33. Who will bring any charge against God's elect or God's chosen? No, nobody. Nobody. It's a done thing for us in Christ. We're, we're, we're in Jesus. And so I, I think what we're saying is let's prayerfully enter daily co-work with God through whatever it is that you do. And the Holy Spirit is with us and in us in all we say and all we do. And then we ask the final question, final slide, because we're one minute over. Why? Well, because God has chosen you and me in Christ and others in Christ. He is calling, uh, that, the others that he's calling. Sorry, I, I didn't read that well. Because God has chosen you in Christ and he has chosen others he is calling those others maybe to meet him through you. So it's how you act on the ball field with that guy. It's how I act if the person gets my order wrong. It's how I go into a situation where I watch people be nasty to other people and I walk in and say, how would I want to be treated in this situation? And I know it's not this person's fault, but they're the first line of, of information. And I'm not going to jump on them as if they, you know, they did this to me. And, and we have a quote there, I'm going to go and tell everyone about you, is what the woman at the well said. And Jesus said, and this is from the chosen, not from the Bible, Jesus said, I was hoping that you would. That's why. That's why we've been chosen, is to go tell people about Jesus. And he's hoping that we'll do that. And he's told us that we have nothing to fear because he's with us. And I still like your granddad. It may yeah. take time and we may not even see it. But we if that's know. what we do, that's all we've been asked to do, and it works. Yep. Not because of us. Right. You want to exclamation point it and pray us out? or? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that, that we oh. are called to love God and reflect that every day, starting on Sunday through the next Saturday. And we are called to help people grow. And I would say that it's not like, a, okay, I'm going to work on Joe for six months. Okay, he's good. I'm gone. You know, I think there yeah. needs to be some follow-up yeah. that you reach back out to people to say how you're going to create accountability on both sides. Let's pray right. and we'll go home. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you so much for, for the time tonight. Father, we pray that uh, what we've done here and what we do every day will bring glory to your name. Father, I pray that you help us when we walk out of here to show people that you are living in us, that we are trying to live the life you want us to live, that it's obvious that we can affect change in people and that we can lead people closer to you and we can make disciples 
and they can make disciples, and it just keeps on going, Father. We're thankful for everything you did, for every example you gave us. We're thankful for the ultimate sacrifice that you laid down your life so that we can know that it's fulfilled and that our love can carry us through. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So do this. Know that you can go re-enter the world in your vocation, and he's with you, and he's empowering you to represent him well. And you're a minister of reconciliation, trying to show the other people in the world what the new world will be like. So God bless you. See you Sunday.